from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. in San Francisco and this is Bloomberg Technology coming up in the next hour hot start to 2022 for Tesla shares surging after the electric car maker smashed its quarterly record for deliveries will the company keep up the momentum plus not a verdict but a big development in the Elizabeth Holmes trial the jury says it's deadlocked on three of the 11 counts what does that mean we will bring you all the details and the 5G delay. The U.S. wants to postpone the rollout due to concerns these more powerful airwaves could make airplanes less safe. Verizon and AT&T vowing to launch their 5G services anyway. We're going to tell you about the latest in the showdown with the FAA. All that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the markets. U.S. stocks starting 2022 at a record and Apple hitting a new record as well. A $3 trillion market cap. Our Kriti Gupta with us now. Kriti, it was brief, but it happened. It absolutely happened. Not only did it hit $3 trillion, it also pushed the S&P 500 to a record high and, of course, drove, drove those Nasdaq gains as well to the tune of 1.2%. But it wasn't alone, Emily. Tesla also coming out with some very big news. So you do have those two, which were your prime drivers for the S&P 500 to its record today. Tesla also coming out, like I said, with a record number of deliveries. And I really want to kind of show you what that looks like, not just in terms of an 87% rise year over year when it comes to those vehicles delivered, but also compared to some of its other competitors. This is a metric I like to look at. This is the market cap per vehicle sold for Tesla. And usually when you kind of compare this to other automakers, it doesn't cut cross past 25,000. Ford, for example, has about 20,000 of market cap per vehicle sold. GM, about 13,000. Well, for Tesla, Emily, the number is 1.3 million. This, of course, including their new share price and their latest delivery number. So really tells you just how big of a company Tesla really is and really explains why it was driving not only the S&P 500, but the Nasdaq as well higher today, uh, intraday. I want to end, though, with the big story on everyone's mind, which really determines the path that 2022 Two is going to take that defensive trade, whether or not tech is going to be in the lead. And that, of course, is the Omicron variant. This is, of course, a case count. The pink line here is going to show you the seven day moving average. You can see we haven't quite hit the peak yet. The big concern is that how long will it take to actually encompass the 300 million population of the United States and how quickly will that pass on? Will it just take a few weeks or perhaps a few months? Whether or not the South African story, the UK story is really a roadmap for the United States. That's really what's going to dictate the markets in 2022, Emily. All right, Kriti, thank you very much. Meantime, New York City might expand its vaccine mandates in April to require boosters. Mayor Eric Adams spoke earlier on Bloomberg on just his third day on the job. And it's needed to do mandates for certain reasons. Let's adjust and do so, and then we'll come back around. But this is the new reality that we must face. Our city and school system must open. We must continue to focus. We can't use lose two more years of education for our children. Public sector employees in New York are required to be fully vaccinated. A private sector mandate went into effect December 27th, requiring employees to get a second dose within 45 days before they can enter their workplaces. Alex Ruoff of Bloomberg Government joining us now to discuss. Alex, so much news uh, about the virus every day. Today there's indications uh, from the FDA about a variant-specific booster. Talk to us about what we can expect there. Well, uh, this was a remark from uh, Peter Marks, is an official with the FDA, uh, you know, who sort of said that, you know, they're, they're thinking about it. This is something that's been a discussion and, you know, something I think we're, we're looking down the road as, as uh, you know, as the pandemic stretches on, we're probably going to have to think about is boosters specifically if this disease continues to advance, uh, you know, and how that affects things like the mandates for work is, is pretty unclear at this point, especially if that's the kind of thing that we're going to start seeing down the road. So how are Americans responding? Obviously, we know that at-home tests are in short supply. What else? Well, you know what? There's also been a big boom uh, on you know, probably on masks, uh, particularly masks that are a little bit better than your typical cloth mask that's, that you're seeing. N95 masks, KN95 masks, the things you typically see in, a, in a, maybe a medical setting or you're more comfortable with 
are flying off the shelves, just like tests. People are kind of stepping their game up on masks as well, particularly in cities where they're seeing bigger cases. And, and that's because there's a better understanding about how this virus is airborne and that having a, you know, a better filter in front of your face is, is a better chance of sort of keeping you safe. It feels like COVID is everywhere, Alex, especially over the last few days. What does this mean for the Biden administration? What new steps might we see the president take? Well, you know, there is increasing pressure from the White House to act here to improve. You know, Biden ran on doing better, on saying the Trump administration fell, fell flat on its face and that they would do better. And I think at this point, you know, there's a lot of pressure for Biden to make sure these testing lines aren't long, making sure they're seeing an impact. I think this is a central part of his legacy. And I, I think there's a lot of pressure on him to use the resources Congress gave him and the resources of you know, the United States to make an impact, to get you know, these problems worked out so that it seems to, you know, seems to work a lot better. I, I think we're expecting them you know, to react better and to find a way to tamp these cases down uh, you know, using the power of the federal government. All right, Alex Ruoff, Bloomberg Government, thank you for those updates. I want to stick with vaccines now. Starbucks saying that by February 9th, its U.S. employees must be vaccinated against COVID or test weekly. The new rules applying to staffing cafes, offices, plants, and distribution centers. This according to a message to employees from the company's North America president. Starbucks is also requiring U.S. workers to disclose their vaccination status by January 10th. Now, Tesla... Shares jumping as much as 10% to kick off the year, as we mentioned earlier. This after the company reported a quarterly record for deliveries, more than 308,000 vehicles worldwide. The much better than expected results driving total sales for the year to more than 936,000, which is about 87% higher than 2020. Bloomberg's Dana Hall joins us now to discuss why did analysts, Dana, get this quarter so wrong? Well, that is a very good question. I mean, this was a huge, huge beat. And, you know, in looking at Bloomberg's terminal, a lot of the a lot of the analysts have not updated their models since October. And so, you know, as the months go on, I mean, Elon dropped some hints on Twitter, like we're not going to focus on the end of the quarter so much. So maybe that was his way of sandbagging. Maybe people read that as that the quarter wasn't going to be strong. But you know, I mean, we're talking like 45,000 more cars than what the consensus was. So it was a huge beat. And you're seeing the stock reaction today accordingly. So what is the conversation now happening among investors starting off the year? Well, I think for so long, the question about EVs was demand. You would hear over and over again two things. A, well, you know, are EVs ever really going to go mainstream or, the, or are they just going to appeal to this like niche audience? And then the second one was, okay, well, Tesla, you know, makes EVs, but the competition is coming. And I think that what you're seeing now is that clearly the EV revolution is here. Demand is incredibly strong, not just for Tesla's cars, but for the cars that Ford has, for Rivian's offerings. So, like, there's not a demand question. There is demand for EVs. Now the conversation is more about supply. Like, can these automakers make enough of these vehicles? Do they have the factory capacity to sort of build these things. And the competition really isn't between electric vehicles and electric vehicles. It's between electric vehicles and ICE. So can you get more people to switch from driving a gas-powered car to an electric car? And you're already seeing in, in, in Europe, like in countries like Norway and the UK, that, that that adoption curve is really looking more and more like a hockey stick. So talk to us about then t how Tesla keeps up with the coming competition. Obviously, there are other manufacturers making cars on the roads, and there are more electric cars and new models to come. True, but Tesla is opening two new factories in Austin and Berlin. So they have the capacity to make more cars than all of these other automakers. I mean, Rivian, for example, like just announced that they're going to build a factory in Georgia. Well, that's great, but like the, the factory isn't online yet. But I mean, Tesla has new factories coming online this year. So capacity is one piece. And then I think the other piece that's really important is the supercharger network. I mean, Tesla invested very early on in its own proprietary charging network, which gives it this huge advantage over every other automaker because. You buy a Tesla, you go to the supercharger, and it's like you're locked into this ecosystem that uh, no other automaker really has its own proprietary charging network. So how important is China then, especially this year, as a market to Tesla? 
China is huge. Um, I mean, for for a long time, Tesla's biggest markets have been the U.S. and China. It'll be interesting to see if China begins to eclipse the U.S. Um, and we know that the factory in Shanghai is you know far leaner and more capital efficient than the one in Fremont. Um, right now, all of the cars that are exported to Europe are made in China. And, and, you know, Tesla is expanding and opening more service centers and showrooms in China. And I just think, um, you know, after some bad publicity earlier this year, just what the kind of brand recognition is in China is going to be very key. All right. Bloomberg's Dana Hall, thank you for your reporting there. Coming up, can Bitcoin make a comeback in 2022? We're going to talk about where the latest largest cryptocurrency is headed this year after a rocky finish to 2021 with FTX CEO Sam Bankman Freed next. This is Bloomberg. come back with a bang or should we bundle up for a crypto winter to talk about that and more crypto trends for the year I want to bring in FTX's CEO Sam Bankman Freed Sam good to have you back with us to kick off the year so everyone is asking the question after a 60 percent rise last year but a rocky year end what's your prediction for Bitcoin in 2022 where does it go yeah, I mean, first of all, you know, none of this is financial advice. No one knows for sure. And if, if anyone says they know for sure, that's how you know that they don't know what they're talking about. But, <laughs> you know, I, I'm optimistic about it. And, and the things that make me optimistic basically are more regulatory clarity um, in the U.S. and globally, which I think could could help a ton, um, and institutional adoption. Um, and, and I think those are also related to each other. Let's talk about institutional adoption. How much faster do you see that accelerating this year in particular? I think that, well, a lot of it depends on exactly what happens on the regulatory front as well. But I think that especially if um, places feel like they're getting clarity, that could come, you know, in a tidal wave. It could come in a trickle. I don't expect it to come in a tidal wave in the next three to six months. Um, it, among other things, it just takes time for institutions to onboard to new platforms, to new asset classes. Um, it's going to be a long process, probably stretched out over a few years. Um, but uh, but the, the size of it could be really enormous. I think basically every large financial institution I've talked to, every large bank, every large investment bank, uh, pension funds, they're all eyeing the sector. Many of them have started breaking ground on their activities in it. Um, but it's just slow and, and it takes time. The onboarding compliance processes here are not fast ones. Well, and speaking of time, Bitcoin isn't a spring chick. I mean, Bitcoin Network launched exactly 13 years ago today, I believe. Yep. And you yourself just testified at this hearing on Capitol Hill about uh, cryptocurrency and regulation. What are you preparing for? Is, is this year going to be the year, 13 years later, that real regulation happens? I don't think it's all going to come like in one, you know, one day on one year. But I do think that there's going to be a lot happening this year. We've already seen a lot happen last year, but a lot of that has been preparatory. We've seen a lot of different governments announce that there will be regulatory frameworks coming out over the next year. Um, we've seen a lot of them make statements about crypto and, you know, all the major financial regulators in the United States and the lawmakers are, are investing heavily in their knowledge of the sector. Um, I think that you're probably going to see the first batch of it coming out in 2022. I think you're probably going to see some, you know, some clarity on stablecoin um, regulation. I think you're probably going to see um, some stuff about markets regulation with the SEC and CFTC. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to see some statements about asset, asset issuances, although I also would guess that that's going to stretch over into the next few years. Earlier today, there was a whale alert on Twitter that $20 million in Tether was transferred from an unknown wallet onto FTX. Can you confirm that? And, and, and if so, what does that tell us about the market? I, I, so I don't know for sure. It wouldn't surprise me. There is something like a billion dollars a day of uh, stable coins that come uh, you know, through FTX. So I, you know, that, that would not shock me. 
Um, Tether, it's it's one of the most transacted digital assets um, in the ecosystem. I, you know, some people sometimes look at stablecoins moving onto exchanges as a bullish sign. You know, some people see it as inflows coming in. Um, you know, similarly to how sometimes people see Bitcoin or Ethereum or other cryptocurrencies going onto exchanges as bearish as a sign of uh, of sellers coming in. But you know, it could be a lot of things. It could just be arbitrage happening cross platform. Um, and so it's you know any one instance like that isn't necessarily that meaningful. Um, but you know if you see a deluge of it, that 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 could mean buyers. Okay, the other big trend this year, of course, is the metaverse. And so many people are speculating about what the intersection of crypto and the metaverse actually looks like. What does it look like to you? What will the role of cryptocurrency in the metaverse be? Yeah, I mean, again, it's going to take some time, but you know, I, I think that there is a ton of avenues. I think NFTs in video games is one of the largest. There are billions of users of, uh, of video games worldwide. Um, and I, so I think that starting to see digital assets make an appearance there, I expect that's going to happen over the next few years. We've seen a lot of interest from the sector in that. Um, I think that social media is going to start to interface with Web3. I think that could be a rocky process. And we haven't seen that many really concrete steps in that direction, although obviously Facebook you know, rebranding to Meta is a step in that direction. Um, and you know, I expect that we might see a cooling off, at least relatively speaking, of some of the uh, pure NFT activity that we've seen recently, unless and until we see uh, sort of large uh, you know, names and players and partners come into the space. But I do expect that to happen and that that will be supercharging the next piece of Web3 growth. FTX has certainly made a name for itself at the intersection of sports and crypto, whether it is baseball or basketball or the Super Bowl uh, commercial coming up, F1. Um, talk to us about the, you know, the value of this and where do you see it going? Yeah, I think that you know, the biggest things that we're looking at right now are basically getting our name out there um, and uh, you know, starting to build out a brand. Um, and I, I think that you know this is less about trying to immediately grow the user base. It's much more about I uh, you know letting people know who we are. We're really really excited about a number of the partners that we've made. Uh, a few of whom are are on the screen right now, um, and <laughs> and have been really great to work with. Um, and uh, I I think that we see it as look we're new as a company. We're we're two years old. Um, you know, substantially newer than most of the players in the industry. Um, that means that you know we're not a household name uh, for a lot of people in the same way that that some of the other players are. And uh, I think that step one of that is us trying to communicate who we are as a company. All right, FTX CEO Sam Bagman fried thank you so much for joining us. Good to have you. We'll see where those partnerships take you in the year to come. Coming up. Unlike baseball, Twitter's policy allows you up to five strikes and you're out. Not enough for Republican Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's the latest to be permanently banned from the platform. Details on that next. This is Bloomberg. Politician permanently banned from Twitter and now temporarily suspended on Facebook. Republican Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene was booted from Twitter Sunday after repeated violations of the platform's rules on spreading misinformation about COVID-19, including false claims about extremely high amounts of COVID vaccine deaths. So she said. Facebook just suspended her for about 24 hours. Bloomberg's Anna Edgerton joins us now with more. Anna, what do you make of the different approaches from Twitter and Facebook here? 
Well, it kind of follows a pattern we've seen in Twitter having, it seems to be a bit of a lower tolerance for this kind of thing. They outlined their five-strike policy when it comes to medical misinformation, whereas Facebook said they didn't actually have a policy in place to remove Marjorie Taylor Greene's account, that they were just suspending her for 24 hours. This is similar to the approach they took with President, former President Donald Trump after the January 6th insurrection last year when his postings on social media encouraged his supporters to come to the Capitol building that day. So the Twitter ended up permanently banning the former president, and Facebook suspended him eventually for two years. What is going to happen now, and, 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 and what, are we, what are you hearing in terms of reaction on Capitol Hill? You know, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out because Green is a pretty marginal figure. You know, she's uh, definitely to, on the, the the far right side of the the conservative uh, caucus in the House of Representatives. But this is just going to fuel arguments from Republicans that these tech platforms censor conservative and, con and conservative points of view. And so, you know, this is something that we've seen as a really potent campaigning issue and a really um, a fruitful way for Republicans to raise money, and that's going to be increasingly the case this year as we head into the midterm elections in November. Meantime, you've got some alternative platforms cropping up. Are we expecting those to get any traction? Yeah, it's interesting. This is where we saw uh, the statements from Marjorie Taylor Greene today. She posted to Telegram, which is a platform that uh, has kind of less rigorous content moderation and allows uh, politicians and public figures to have their own channels. She's also active on Getter, which is another kind of alternative social media platform uh, touted by conservatives. But, you know, it doesn't seem like these alternatives are going to get much traction in the broader public, but it could contribute to kind of the bulk organization of the social media space where you have conservatives and right-wing users leaving platforms like Twitter, Facebook, even Google's YouTube, and moving to some of the more um, kind of niche social media sites, including Parler. So as we head into the midterms, what are you going to be watching in terms of this battleground? The thing that will be interesting to see is how this big tech backlash changes over the year as we get closer to the election and after we see the results of the election. Republicans are really well positioned to take back the House of Representatives, and that could really shift the legislative tactic in Washington if Republicans were con to control one or both chambers of Congress heading into next year. All right. Bloomberg's Anna Edgerton, thank you for that update. Coming up, big tech in 2022, continuing to see strong investor demand after giants like Alphabet and Apple and Amazon powered U.S. stocks to a third straight winning year in 2021. Where is this year headed? We'll discuss. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. I want to turn back to Apple now making history with the stock briefly hitting a historic $3 trillion market valuation for the first time ever. And bring back our Kriti Gupta now for more. It was brief, Kriti, but talk to us about what this means to kick off the year. Yeah, Emily, brief, but it happened. And it really does signify something good for the macro economy because Apple can actually kind of be a little bit of a macro proxy there where you start to see kind of its uh, relationship with foot traffic into, the, into its stores, into the Genius Bar. You see a lot of their kind of consumer disposable income being spent on luxury products, iPhones, Macs, think about it. So Apple was kind of served as this kind of gauge for the broader benchmark and for the broader economy in terms of the strength of the consumer. And that's really what this chart shows here, the correlation between Apple and the stock market, this idea that if Apple goes higher, the stock market does too. And the correlation did briefly 
dip in that it showed that if, the, if Apple was higher, the stock market was kind of the contrarian indicator. But it looks like that correlation is back together, which shows you once again that Apple is kind of serving as this broader macro story. But it's not just today that it's doing that. It's been doing that all of last year, 2021. It was actually the second biggest driver for the S&P 500 right behind Microsoft. But let me tell you what was dragging the S&P 500 down in 2021. That, of course, is also a tech story. PayPal, fintech, a lot of that crypto exposure actually dropped, uh, dragged, I should say. It was a weight on the S&P 500. Alongside Disney, we like to look at Disney as kind of the best of both worlds. It's a recovery trade because of its cruise lines, its parks, but also a tech name, a kind of defensive name because of its streaming platform. Either way, the strategy didn't work because it was actually the second biggest decliner, the second biggest weight on the S&P 500. So you can really see how tech has kind of pulled the S&P 500 in both directions. But let's bring it back to Apple, though. Three trillion dollars. What does it mean for the S&P 500 next? Well, every time it hits a trillion dollar milestone, Apple shares tend to drop quite a bit. When it hit one trillion dollars in the fall of 2018, it dropped 40 percent, dragging the S&P 500 down. 20%. That was that big bear market that we saw in the fall of 2018. Moving on to 2020, right before the election, we saw the big tech wreck. Well, Apple hit $2 trillion then too and dropped 20%, dragging the benchmark down 10%. So the question, Emily, is if it stays above the $3 trillion market cap, what happens broadly for the S&P 500? All right, let's try to answer that question. Critty, thanks so much. I want to stay on this $3 trillion market cap milestone and bring in Creative Strategies Principal Analyst and CEO Ben Beharin. Ben, is it worth it and will it stick? I, I definitely think it's worth it and I do think it will stick. If you look at a lot of the investment consensus out there, I think a number of, uh, of, of large um, banks have put somewhere around a, a $200 per share um, estimate onto Apple, which just shows you, again, in, increased confidence in all of their categories. I think when you look at Apple's historical performance as well, so many of their businesses have tended to do well, even in times of economic hardship, not that we're in that now, but I think people are looking at the role that inflation may play in, um, in consumer confidence. I think Apple continues to be that pretty safe bet for growth. And I think just look at a number of their, their growth business opportunities. It's not just iPhone, you've got wearables, you've got AirPods, you've got the Mac now starting to, to become a growth business that, um, that we're particularly really interested in to see how the how the Mac grows and bullish on the Mac. So, you know, again, I think investor confidence is is really at a significant high for Apple and, and a number of big tech companies. So I definitely think it will stick. And I think Apple's a, a really safe growth bet for a lot of funds. When you look at the near term, though, would you predict drops like we saw after 1T and 2T? Uh, I think you still might see a little bit of, of variation. I'm not sure we're going to see significant drops because, again, I think people know that the product cycles are really strong. It'll be interesting to see really the commentary that comes out around um, around Apple's December earnings and just get a sense of what, what any kind of supply chain, which is really the biggest impact to potential volume is just what's going on in the semiconductor supply chain. I think demand remains significantly strong for their products. We see that in our research. Um, I know a lot of big funds are seeing that. So I wouldn't expect huge drops. I do think, again, there's some level of drop that, that happens, but I think the stock continues to grow well over the next year. Big tech in general added $2.5 trillion in market values just in the last year. Microsoft, Alphabet, Apple, of course. Where do you see that going in 2022? Yeah, I think a big story is going to continue to be these large tech firms and uh, just their asserted dominance in the markets that they play. I mean, if you just look at the names that you mentioned, with the exception of Apple, which is kind of the rarity in terms of their overall CapEx spend, you know, you got Microsoft, you got Alphabet, you've got Amazon, all spending $30, $40 billion in CapEx estimated in 2022 and, and growing. It makes it really hard for anyone to displace incumbents when it's going to require that level of, of finances to go into not just cloud, but new consumer hardware. If you think about AR, VR and headsets, these are expensive, really big bets. And I think that's why there is so much investor confidence in so many of these big tech stocks, because they have the capital to be patient. They have the capital to develop these markets, enter the right products into these markets and actually satisfy any demand that comes up from there. And so I think that's why you're seeing that, con that continued confidence. And, and again, your guys' numbers have shown, you know, if they outperform many of these other indexes and, and, and other stocks in the market, investors are going to gravitate to those bets that are returning them the consistent uh, the yields that they're looking for. What are the other tech stocks you're following? I know you've been looking into semis in particular. 
Yeah, I'm super bullish on semiconductors. Honestly, I think the sent a lot of semi stocks are um, are really being undervalued. I think if you just look at the the baseline, you know, you've got your Nvidia, you've got AMD, you've got Marvell, Broadcom, a number of these these companies that are going to drive this next industry of of innovation is is so significant. And and we rely on I mean, every new category you talk about automotive, you know, next gen IoT, uh, smart cities industrial IoT, uh, ARV, I mean, you name it, the semiconductors are going to be the driving force for that. So when you look at who those real big players are, those are the ones that I think are, are, are dominant. Intel is a really interesting one to watch. Honestly, you know, if you look at Intel's PE, it, it shows you that there's a number of, um, of investors who are not sure that the CapEx they're going to spend over the next four years to get parity with TSMC on leading edge and really become back into the forefront of leading the industry is going to be worth it. But I think their product uh, strategy is sound. I think they, they've got a really good lineup, obviously getting into GPUs now to create some competition with NVIDIA could be significant. So there's a lot of really great stories around semiconductors that I think people are sleeping on. And interestingly, a lot of funds are actually underweight in terms of their um, portfolio for semi. So I think there's a lot of room to grow and a lot of innovation ahead that actually gets me really excited about the semiconductor industry. Then, of course, there's the metaverse. The Oculus VR headset was a big seller over the holidays. Who's going to win the metaverse? And is it really going to be that big a deal? Yeah, metaverse is one of those terms. I'm, I'm sure, Emily, you've had plenty of people on uh, talking about different visions of the metaverse. It's it's really, really challenging. You know, my, my caution to everybody in the industry when I talk to those looking into the category, building for the category, is we've got to be careful about how early it is and what lessons we learn now. Because oftentimes when you're really early to a category, you learn the wrong lessons. They're not the right um, either lessons or trend lines or consumer demand that we see. You know, as interesting as Oculus is and this concept of the metaverse, we just don't know what it is yet. There might not be one winner. There might be many winners. We don't know how open it's going to be. It might be much more controlled. Facebook may have a platform. Microsoft may have a platform. Google, Applebit may have a platform. Apple may have a platform. And to some degree, we don't know how much these might interoperate in the same way that PCs and and, and smartphones, different platforms aren't completely interoperable. So there's going to be some 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 interesting challenges. I think um, you know I think the jury's still out on what consumer engagement looks like with uh, with VR yet. I mean, yes, Oculus was a great seller, and I really do think Facebook has a quality product with Oculus. But how off, how how long are consumers engaging in in these experiences? Is it 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour? Do they use it for more than six months? I think these are a range of questions that we still have to develop. And it's just really, really early in the cycle. So again, I think there's a ton of innovation that can happen. It's going to be driven by semiconductors that have to get a lot smaller than they are today to cre create the kind of immersive experiences we all hope that can fit on our heads or go into a pair of glasses or even other things that we wear. So a lot of innovation is needed. Some, some big breakthroughs in technology are needed. Um, but I think there's reason to be excited. But at the same time, I think we have to be reasonable in our approach of uh, how fast this category will develop. All right, Creative Strategies Principal Analyst and CEO Ben Beharin. Ben, good to have you back on the show. Thank you. Good to hear where you, where you stand. Meantime, Microsoft offering a fix for a year change bug on its Exchange platforms. The bug causing some email messages to become stuck due to what it said was a New Year related date checking failure. The company says the problem wasn't security related, but they didn't say how widespread the issue was. Coming up. A warning from major airlines. A new 5G service being rolled out by AT&T and Verizon this week could interfere with aircraft electronics. Why the wireless carriers are rejecting calls to postpone the rollout? Next, this is Bloomberg. AT&T and Verizon have rejected a U.S. request to delay this week's launch of a new variation of 5G mobile that airlines say might interfere with aircraft electronics. The CEOs of the two companies say they would be willing, though, to pause deployments for six months near certain airports. Bloomberg's Todd Shields joins us now with more. So, Todd, is this new version of 5G actually dangerous? And, 
dangerous to airplanes in particular? Well, that, that's the multi-billion dollar question. Uh, it's 5G as we've come to know it in recent months, but it's 5G on a new set of airways. Uh, these airways until recent years were used by satellites, very weak transmissions. Now they'll be used by 5G on towers near airports. And aviation interests say that the signals from this, uh, from this 5G can interfere with altimeters, devices that check the altitude of the aircraft uh, in coming months. So um, it, it's a he, he said, she said kind of situation. On the one hand, aviation insists there's potential danger. AT&T and Verizon insist that there's plenty of separation and the, that the hazardous interference just won't happen. So here we sit days before the deployment. Well, and 5G didn't happen overnight. So were the airlines and the telcos just not talking to each other? It's kind of an odd thing. Uh, apparently not too much. The most of the discussion took place at the Federal Communications Commission through a big fat docket with hundreds of entries over many years. And there's not a lot in it from the aviation interest. There was some early on. And the FCC in its order that set this up said, well, aviation hasn't presented us with a compelling case that there might be trouble here, but we'll listen to more as we go along. Uh, some talks between aviation and telecommunications kind of fizzled out. The auction went ahead. The FCC sold the rights to the airlines for more than $80 billion to the wireless people. And that's one reason the wireless interests are so interested in going ahead. It's a big investment and a big step in their, uh, their, their evolution to a new generation of communications. Well, it, 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 you know, in, in a situation like this, one would think you always err on the side of caution. How do you see this getting worked out and in the next, you know, couple of days? Yeah, right. It's supposed to light up on Wednesday. Uh, uh, what, we, we've got some vague indications of a solution in that the wireless uh, companies, in a letter Sunday to Transportation Secretary Buttigieg and to the FAA administrator, said they might pause near airports, which is where you have your landing approaches and you're close to the ground and you really need your altimeters to be most accurate. So they might pause there if, on the other hand, the, uh, the aviation side de-escalates or does not escalate further, which is taken to mean, please don't sue us, don't drag this into court, let's reach a last minute deal. So that may be unfolding in coming days. All right, Bloomberg's Todd Shields, thanks so much for joining us. Obviously, we'll stay posted on that story. Meantime, jurors in the Elizabeth Holmes fraud trial were told to work through an impasse in their deliberations. This after a jury, the jury told the judge they were struggling to agree on three of the 11 charges against the Theranos founder. And we just got a breaking headline that the jury has sent another note to the judge just moments ago. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Joel Rosenblatt on the phone, who's been at every single day of this trial. Joel, what does this mean? Well, as you just said, Emily, we got another note. I, I haven't, uh, I'm going to go momentarily to go hear what that's about. We've got a lot of movement suddenly in this case. Uh, the note earlier today indicated that they are at an impasse on three of the 11 counts. Now, they didn't say that they have decided that they have a verdict in the other eight counts, but reading between the lines, that's probably what's going on. I think uh, I'm kind of expecting that we're going to have a decision in this case uh, maybe as soon as this afternoon. I just got a note from the court saying that that note will be read at 3.10 p.m. Pacific, so about 25 minutes from now. You know, is there anything that we can glean from the amount of time that this jury has taken to deliberate? They are on their seventh day of deliberations. They have asked very few questions of the judge, you know, what, if anything, can we infer about their decision? Well, you know, I just want to say that they, they did ask for one important piece of testimony, which was a playback of a, of a recorded investor call that when Elizabeth Holmes is, is uh, making a pitch for her company to investors. That was recorded surreptitiously. That was a really key piece of evidence. So you can kind of put together how they might be um, figuring this out. The, the counts roughly break down to into uh, allegations that she defrauded investors on one part and patients on the other. You could see how the investor case is a stronger case, and they may have decided that, either against her or, you know, as an acquittal. 
and that the patient counts are more confusing, and, and that's what they're asking about. I don't know that. We don't. No one knows that. But we're going to find out very quickly. I think, maybe in you know twenty minutes or so. Now there are eleven counts under consideration here. If she is found guilty of, let's say, only one count, what does that mean? If she's found guilty of one count. Um, each count is, is uh, she, with each count, if she's found guilty of, of a single count, she faces up to 20 years in prison for that single count. That would be a win for pros the prosecution. That would be a win for the government. Uh, they would take that. They wouldn't be happy with it, and they would have to decide whether or not to retry her on, on the other uh, counts if there was a mistrial or if they lost. But I'm guessing not. I'm guessing not. I'm guessing that they would take that as a win. So, uh, you know, in, in terms of, you know, one of the more interesting parts of this case is the, the amount of time that this case has dragged on. Four months, big high-profile trials, Kyle Rittenhouse, Ghislaine Maxwell have come and gone while this case has continued. One of the things I thought that, that, that the judge said this morning that was interesting to the jury was there's no hurry. You don't have to rush. So even uh, seven days into deliberations, through Christmas, through New Year's, he's saying, take your time. What do you make of that? Well, so what you're seeing there is that the judges really – judges can't interfere with the jury's deliberations. That's why we don't know more about these counts, even though the jury has come back and said, you know, we're, we're stuck on these three. He's not allowed to even ask what those three are. He's not allowed to meddle. So he's really just deferring to the jury, giving it its time and space to make its decision. That's also a consideration on appeal, right? They don't want – the judge doesn't want – uh, her lawyers to find something wrong or the prosecution to find something wrong with what he's done. So he's saying that, and that's what he has to do. Of course, he's the only one feeling or saying that because there's all kinds of reasons why everyone else wants this to finish quickly, not the least of which is the virus. So we're all just kind of hoping nobody gets sick here and, and then a verdict is reached before, you know, something bad happens in, in that respect. Right. Obviously, we are also all in the middle of a COVID surge. Okay, Joel, I'm going to let you go run into the courtroom. Again, that note from the jury going to be read in about 20 minutes. The jury, again, has sent a, uh, the, a note to the judge, uh, the jury that is deliberating the fate of Elizabeth Holmes. We're going to find out what uh, they have said there momentarily. Coming up, we're going to get a lot more on Apple's latest milestone. Plus, find out why CES is still pushing ahead as more big-name companies pull out of in-person attendance. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Let's return now to one of our top stories. Apple briefly rising above a $3 trillion market cap. For more, we're joined by our Apple reporter, Mark Gurman. Mark, we all blinked today, but we did not miss this. What's your take? Well, if you blink too long, you may have missed it because it only lasted for <laughs> a, a few minutes. Obviously, this is a major, major milestone for Apple. They're obviously the only U.S. company, technology giant, really any company to ever hit this $3 trillion marker of their market cap. And it's really a testament to how the company has grown over the last decade uh, since Tim Cook took over for Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs liked to say in the past that he was proud that he could take a small table and fit every Apple product on that small table. And he compared it to the rest of the industry where a lot of these companies, HP, Samsung, whatever, had tons of products. Well, Tim Cook has taken a different approach. There are several different types of iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches, AirPods now. And what they're doing is they've been expanding the product line to generate more revenue and to get new users. And that's part of one of the big reasons why they have grown so much so quickly. Well, 2T just last year. We'll have to see if 4T comes this year. Before you go, I want to ask you about CES because we had a couple more high-profile pullouts. Peloton, Mobileye also saying now they're not going to the in-person event. Who's actually going to be at CES and why are they still hosting the show? Well, I have three big names for you. Samsung, Qualcomm, and Sony. Those are the three big remainders there from the consumer tech industry. Samsung will launch a new phone later today. You'll see new chip announcements from Qualcomm and a slew of new TVs and other entertainment devices uh, from Sony. So look out for those. But like you said, most companies are either not participating or, you know, sharing their product announcements from home. 
Does this say anything about the future of the show or is this purely a COVID related slump? I think there's two things going on here. It's COVID related, one, for safety purposes, but two, I think these companies know they don't necessarily need CES to get their news out. They're able to reach reporters, reach consumers, and reach media directly online. All right, Mark Gerben, we'll be watching uh, what remains of the show through this week. Tomorrow we're going to be speaking with the president of the Consumer Technology Association, uh, Gary Shapiro. He'll talk us, to us all about CES. And also on the show, Renee James, CEO of the semiconductor company Ampere Computing. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.